Is there about to be a diplomatic solution that will end Israel's war against Hezbollah in Lebanon? Well, talks are in advanced stages, and US envoy Amos Hochstein may arrive in Israel and soon in order to finalize an agreement. But what exactly is being discussed? Well, according to reports, Israel is demanding an improved version of UN Security Council Resolution 1701, which is the resolution that ended the last war with Hezbollah back in 2006. Now, this resolution from 18 years ago called for the Lebanese army to disarm Hezbollah and take responsibility for what happens inside Lebanon. But this never happened. It required Hezbollah to withdraw from the Blue Line in southern Lebanon to an area north of the Litani River. But this never happened. 1701 failed. The Security Council failed. And ultimately, diplomacy failed. Israel cannot and will not accept the same failed piece of paper that led to the reality that we now find ourselves in. And that's why Israel is demanding a better and clearer UN Security Council resolution. Israel wants to see the heavy deployment of the Lebanese army at the Israeli border and not Hezbollah on the Israeli border. Hezbollah needs to be far away from the Israeli border in order to give space to breed and for people to live. There is another important Israeli demand. Israel demands freedom of operation in Lebanon for the IDF if there are new threats in Lebanon that need to be removed. And Israel will never again allow a situation where a terrorist army can mobilize on its border and threaten its population. Israel will never again be in a situation where another October 7th massacre can happen. And Israel has made this very clear every single day for the past more than one year now. Now, right now, it's too soon to say if there will be some kind of ceasefire deal that ends the war in Lebanon. But if it happens, if there is a ceasefire in Lebanon in the days ahead, and if Israel's demands are met, it means something. It means that Hezbollah has backed down. Now, let's remember, Hezbollah decided to join Hamas's war on October 8th of last year, one day after the October 7th massacre. Hezbollah said that it would not stop attacking Israel until there was a ceasefire in Gaza. And there hasn't been a ceasefire in Gaza because Hamas has continued to attack Israel and it continues to hold 101 hostages. Now, the fact that there are negotiations now for ending the war in Lebanon means that Hezbollah, what's left of its leadership, has decided to stop tying its fate to Hamas. Now, Hassan Nasrallah, Hezbollah's longtime warlord, went to war for Yar Sinwa and Hamas. And Nasrallah and Sinwa are both now dead. So let's hope that the region can build a better future without Hamas in power in Gaza and without Hezbollah terrorizing Israel from Lebanon. But right now, the war continues. A Hezbollah drone just stuck, struck the Israeli coastal city of Nahria and the IDF continues its operations in Lebanon. Israeli soldiers continue to risk their lives to fight Hezbollah and protect the people of Israel. And we'll have to wait and see if diplomacy can end the war or if Hezbollah wants to keep fighting. Right now, there are also reports of hostage, nego hostage negotiations rather, with Hamas in Gaza. The details that are leaked to the media are less important than the big picture. Hamas continues to hold 101 Israeli hostages in its underground terror dungeons inside Gaza. It's frankly barbaric. We want, and rather I should say, need them home now. We need more pressure on Hamas and Hamas's patrons, Qatar, Turkey, and Iran, so that Hamas will lay down its weapons and release the hostages. There still remain so many open questions. How many hostages are still alive? Who's holding them and where are they exactly? Who represents the terrorists holding hostages in Gaza now that Yas Sinwar and most of the Hamas senior leadership in Gaza are dead? Now, some of these questions will be answered in negotiations that are taking place currently in Qatar, and Israel will gain information on how Hamas is currently operating. But this is what's very clear right at this moment. The Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, has offered amnesty to any Hamas terrorist who is holding Israeli hostages. If the terrorists release the hostages, the terrorists can live. And I wish that more world leaders would tell Hamas this simple message. Take the deal. All right, now it's time to take some questions from our audience watching live. Thank you, Asher. This question is from our YouTube live from Sarah. Why, if Israel is clearly winning the war on Hezbollah, are we talking about a ceasefire and not a capitulation? Are we going back to 2006? No, let's make something very clear. We are most certainly not going back to 2006, and that is the change in the status quo that Israel is looking to uh, implement when it comes to southern Lebanon 
and what's happening inside that country. But ultimately, you know, we need to consider what we're thinking about when we talk about capitulation. As it stands, since 2006, the, the reality, the political reality in Lebanon has fundamentally changed. And Hezbollah now stands as one of the primary political powers inside Lebanon. It is not to Israel's interest or advantage for the entirety of Lebanon to collapse and crumble to its knees. And as we've said repeatedly, Israel's war is not with the Lebanese people. It is with Hezbollah. So it is absolutely critical that Israel find a way to create a sustainable situation on that border, to allow Lebanon to continue to function as a state in its northern border, to bring their troops, the regular Lebanese army, to come into that area between the Blue Line and the Latani River in order to provide security and stability in that region and not give up power in a vacuum to the likes of Hezbollah or other militant groups that may seek to take advantage. Iran is determined that its proxy should be in power in Lebanon. Iran is determined that its proxy should have the capacity to have hundreds of thousands of missiles and drones and, and all other forms of uh, military capabilities aimed at Israel to threaten Israel's communities in the north of the country and frankly throughout the entire country whenever they see fit. Israel is looking to shift that status quo, but ultimately not at the expense of the entirety of Lebanon and the Lebanese people. We're looking for sustainability in this region where frankly there has not been any thanks to the Iranian proxy. This is a question from Itai on our live stream who asks, is Israel waiting for Iran to attack again in order so that Israel can strike back and finally target Iran's nuclear facilities? What is the latest in this back and forth situation with Iran firing ballistic missiles at Israel and Israel responding in Iran? Itai, it's a critical question that you're asking there. And obviously, uh, it, no one is quite sure if we've seen the last of these uh, back and forth strikes uh, between Iran and Israel. What Israel has done in, most, in its most recent strikes is show very clearly and directly to Iran that we will not tolerate uh, its sort of uh, unbearable activity like the 181 ballistic missiles that they fired across the country wildly, uh, you know, aimed at all sorts of uh, facilities, aimed at uh, sending millions of Israelis uh, running into bomb shelters. Well, this would not be a tolerated activity that Iran will be able to get away with without response. But what Israel has shown is that it is able, capable of targeting clearly and with surgical precision Iranian uh, missile facilities, anti-air defense facilities, and to operate inside uh, Iranian airspace freely if the IDF and the IAF uh, particularly so chooses. This is an important message to send to Iran. But again, as I said earlier, when it regards the Lebanon and the Lebanese people, the war and fights with Iran that are being waged right now are with the Iranian regime with that theocratic, theocratic authoritarian regime in Iran run by the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, who has taken over the Iranian people. Our war is not with the Iranian people themselves, but rather with their rogue leadership and the uh, slew of uh, proxies that they have funded and supported throughout the region as they look to destabilize Israel, Israeli interests, and indeed American and Western interests as a whole. So this is really the goal and the military aims that Israel has set out here. Full-scale war does not benefit those aims right now, but we will remain to see if the status quo should change, if Israel's interests should change. Obviously, you know, anything can be on the cards in the future, but for the time being, Israel has made very clear with their latest strike a message to Iran. This is a question from Marty on our live stream who says he would like to know why is there no discussion about the Hamas Covenant of 1988 which expresses the ideology to end Israel and kill Jews? We need to educate the media about this issue. Why, why is Hamas, Hamas's ideology left out of the picture, do you think? Now, frankly, this is a, a critical philosophical question and uh, you know, one that I think many in Israel and many who are informed on the region and the region's history grapple with regularly. You know, when it comes to Hamas's ideology and, and understanding it, it's a question not only of education, but of understanding the sort of uh, difference in uh, civilizational views that we're dealing with here. Israel, as a democratic, liberal democracy, you know, fighting in the Middle East to preserve those sort of democratic rights that are, uh, you know, critical to the fundamental, fundamental underpinnings of Western civilization versus, frankly, the barbarity of Hamas and their desire for you know, a chartered a genocidal assault on Israel where they would like to see uh, Israel as a whole wiped out and the Jews cleared from the land. You know, this fundamental difference, I think, is something that is, is all too important to be made aware to, to everyone around the world when it comes to comparing sides in this conflict to understanding the, the fundamental ideological underpinnings of what we're dealing with here, uh, regardless of any particular small details, minutiae, and particular facts on the ground, that these are the fundamental underpinnings that we're dealing with here. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, frankly, it's probably more discussion than we can get into here on a daily briefing. Um, but I think there's an infantilization of Hamas by, by many of its supporters who don't hold it accountable, who treat it simply as a, as a force, of, treat them simply as a force of nature rather than as a complex ideological uh, group with their own set of twisted ideals and monstrous behaviors and something that we really should bring more attention to. But unfortunately, it's not as simple a message to get across and something we'll have to continue to drill into and drill home to both our supporters and obviously the supporters of Hamas alike who would uh, espouse their insane, sick and monstrous ideology. A lot of people on our live stream are asking about the legislation that Israel just passed, which effectively bans cooperation with UNRWA. What are your thoughts on this legislation and what will happen in the days ahead? Look, it has been very clear. UNRWA was founded in 1948 with what was meant to be a, a limited mission uh, to help the uh, you know, then uh, Palestinian refugees. Now, so many years later, is past its mandate. Its mandate is no longer relevant and needs to be changed. And this is precisely uh, the sort of uh, status quo changing move that Israel is attempting to put forward, that frankly, UNRWA is not a sustainable organization, that they've been used time and time again, provably time and time again, uh, their facilities and infrastructure have been utilized by militant groups, uh, you know, all across uh, Palestinian history, but most re recently and most clearly, as we've seen with Hamas. I mean, let's not forget uh, that Yah Sinwa, uh, when his body was finally recovered and found, had uh, UNRWA documents in his pockets. Uh, you know, really, you, you can't get more beyond that. From the sublime to the ridiculous, uh, it really exists that UNRWA is uh, this arcane space, an anachronistic uh, organization that no longer fits into the modern Middle East and modern status quo and has been propped up falsely, and it needs to be changed. A status quo needs to be changed. And I think that's the clear takeaway uh, that we take from this message here and from the latest decisions uh, by the Israeli government to ban operations of UNRWA inside our sovereign territory. This is our final question today, and it's for you personally to ask you about the kinds of things that you're currently working on at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's office. What should people be looking out for in the days ahead, and how can it help them in their conversations that they're having about Israel? Well, thank you so much for that question. I've been working on a number of interesting projects. I hope uh, people have been, had a chance to view on our spokesperson's website. Uh, deep dive investigations that I've been conducting into uh, Wikipedia, the BBC, the New York Times to try and expose some of the biases, the misrepresentations, the poor quality of reporting that's been occurring from those organizations. And that's a series that I hope to continue uh, to be able to put out. So please, if anyone has any recommendations, at Asher Westrop, A-S-H-E-R-W-E-S-T-R-O-P-P, -P -P, um, please reach out, let me know your thoughts. I'm trying to make sure that we're holding media, large-scale organizations, international organizations accountable um, for their biases against Israel, for unfair reporting. And I'm using my decade plus of investigative journalist experience in order to try and dive deep into these conversations. This is critical to what we're doing here and I hope will help to complement so much of the work here that we do at the Israeli Citizen Spokesperson's Office. Um, but, you know, really part of the wider team and the wider message of what we're all trying to do here as we advocate uh, for a return to normalcy and a, and a sense of moral decency uh, relating to everything around Israel, the Middle East and the current wars that are ongoing here. But that is all we have time for right now on today's Daily Briefing. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Please like and subscribe. And if you can, please share these briefings with someone in your life, a friend, a loved one, family member, whomever may benefit from this in order to get the word out. I've been Ashley Westrop Evans. Thanks for watching.